Lecture 2, Missing Markets and Missing Prices. We left our overview of Soviet history in Lesson 1 with Stalin's death in 1953. At that point, the political legal leg of the Soviet institutional framework was incredibly strong as a result of the priority allocation of resources to the military and the widespread use of terror to quell any opposition to the regime. But while repression played a large role in popular support, a term we'll put in quotes, it would be a mistake to think that it was the only source. The Soviet victory in the Great Patriotic War, as it was known in the USSR, and the subsequent expansion of the empire also fed pride in the system. And interestingly, that weak economic leg seemed to be more than holding its own. The 50s were arguably the best decade economically for the Soviet Union. Although reliable data is always a problem given the secrecy of the communist leadership, our best estimates indicate that growth during the decade hovered around 5 to 6 percent per year. Presiding over this period was Nikita Khrushchev, who emerged atop the internal party struggle following Stalin's death to lead the USSR until 1964. One of Stalin's lapdogs, so named for their unquestioning loyalty, Khrushchev rose in the Soviet hierarchy after the Russian Civil War. Stalin sent him to govern the Ukraine in 1939, where he supported and presided over the bloody purges. He was a commissar during World War II, serving as the intermediary between Stalin and his generals in the Great Patriotic War. He was present at the bloody Battle of Stalingrad, a distinction that he always claimed with pride and which gave him credibility with the military. After the war, he was recalled to Moscow, where he became one of Stalin's closest advisors. In many ways, Khrushchev is a study in contradictions. He was ruthless in the pursuit of power, but criticized for being too soft with the West. We see these contradictions emerging early in his undying loyalty and support while Stalin was alive, and then his role in de-Stalinizing the empire after Stalin's death. In 1956, at the 20th Party Congress, Khrushchev gave what has become known as the secret speech. It was actually entitled, On the Cult of Personality and Its Consequences. And in the speech, he denounced Stalin's use of purges to control the military and Communist Party political leaders. His goal was to bring the Communist Party back to the ideals of Lenin, which he believed had been subverted by Stalin's cult of personality. Now, it's important to note, however, that he did not denounce Stalin's arrests, executions, and imprisonments of ordinary citizens. That type of coercion, he believed, was necessary to advance the interests of the party and the state. And, in fact, Soon after the secret speech, Khrushchev's own agricultural collectivization policy would create its own legacy of brutality, although certainly not on the level of Stalin's. Knowledge of the secret speech, or the Khrushchev Report, as it was known in the Soviet Union, spread quickly throughout the USSR, and it wobbled the Soviet framework. BBC Radio reported that the four-hour speech, delivered at midnight, caused such shock to the audience that some in the Communist Party leadership suffered heart attacks. In the days following, as the shock waves spread, others committed suicide. Confusion ensued as knowledge of the speech spread among the citizenry that had been raised to revere Stalin and to remember the triumphs of his leadership. In the end, in fact, Khrushchev had to send the army to put down protests and riots in Georgia, Stalin's homeland in March 1956. However, Khrushchev persisted, and despite the immediate reactions, he succeeded in initiating the de-Stalinization of the Soviet Union. Textbooks were rewritten, statues were removed, and eventually, in 1961, he had Stalin's body removed from public view in Lenin's mausoleum and buried outside the Kremlin wall. While Khrushchev maintained repressive control within the empire, in the period following the secret speech, he initiated policies that led to what is known as the Khrushchev Thaw internationally. 
Instead of retreating behind the Iron Curtain, as Stalin had done, Khrushchev engaged the West. He traveled outside the Soviet Union, even visiting the United States, where he toured farms in a number of American cities. He allowed cultural exchanges and encouraged dialogue with the West. Economically, Khrushchev continued Stalin's choice to emphasize military and heavy industrial production. Looking toward the future, he allocated more and more resources to education and scientific and technological research. The successful launch of the Sputnik satellite into orbit around the Earth in 1957 vindicated his choice, and it served to dampen some of the internal party criticism of his attack on Stalin and seemingly soft stance on the West. And Sputnik definitely steadied any wobbles in that moral cultural leg of the stool. The launch of the first orbiting satellite said to the Soviet people, our technology is number one. It said the same thing to the rest of the world, and it launched the space race that would be a major front in the Cold War for the next several decades. The relative success of the Soviet economy also helped Khrushchev to maintain power, even as he battled the party hardliners backstage. Especially in comparison to earlier decades, the 50s were a decade of significant growth. On the screen, you can see several estimates of Soviet economic growth during that time period. Official party sources claim an impressive average of about 10% per year throughout the decade. However, we offer several estimates because Soviet data was usually suspect, often inflated for propaganda value, and rarely offered for examination by Westerners. But, as data emerged after the fall, researchers tend to accept an impressive 6% average annual growth rate, well above that experienced by the United States during that same period. GDP growth also continued into the 70s, but at a lower rate. And a closer look at the 50s revealed that by 1958, the growth rate had actually begun to decline, and that throughout the period, agriculture had been an ongoing problem. Khrushchev's approach to the agricultural problem was to speed up the creation of huge collectives or factory farms in the interior regions of the Soviet Union. The collectivization started under Stalin had never been completed, as landowners and farmers resisted the order to join cooperatives. Khrushchev stepped up efforts to force their compliance. We'll look more closely at the problems of agriculture in Lesson 4, but the short story is that, like Stalin's, Khrushchev's efforts to fix agriculture through collectivization were a failure. It was true that soil in the interior regions was productive, but it takes more than good soil to make farming economically viable. The infrastructure wasn't adequate for shipping produce over the long distances between the farms and the cities. Transportation costs were high, and in many cases, the time and distances were so great that food rotted before it reached the cities. This food problem fed the discontent of party leaders, as did the public defeat Khrushchev suffered when President Kennedy's naval blockade forced him to remove Soviet missiles from Cuba in October 1962. Having made massive investments in factory farms that continued to fail, and having lost an international standoff over Cuba, Khrushchev eventually succumbed to the hounding of the hardline faction of the Communist Party. He was forced from the premiership in 1964 and retired to Adasha outside Moscow. In that context, then, we'll proceed to use our economic reasoning tools to ask two questions. First, how was the Soviet Union able to post such impressive growth statistics in the 1950s? And then, why wasn't it able to sustain that level of economic growth? In Lesson 1, we used opportunity cost analysis to examine the choices about what to produce, how to produce it, and for whom to produce it that were made by political leaders in the Soviet Union. In this lesson, we'll look at the next layer of the Soviet hierarchy below the leadership, the ministry, and we'll use economic reasoning to investigate how they put the leaders' decisions into effect without markets and without market prices.
Now we've said that all economies have to answer the three basic questions of what, how, and for whom. They just can't escape the reality of scarcity. But they can and do answer those questions in different ways. Market economies like the United States and most Western powers make decentralized decisions about resource use, while planned or command economies like the Soviet Union use centralized decision making. In a decentralized system, allocation of resources, coordination of production, and distribution of output is spontaneous, emerging from the decisions of individuals pursuing their self-interests. So, the question of what to produce, that is, the question of how to allocate scarce resources, is answered by consumers. Products that consumers want and are willing to pay for are produced, and products that consumers aren't willing to pay for are eventually not produced. Producers, working in their own self-interest, try to figure out what goods and services consumers want and then to provide them. They, the producers, have to answer the how question. And because they must compete for consumers' dollars in order to make a profit, they're motivated to use resources in the most valuable ways. And finally, in a decentralized system, the answer to the question of who gets what is produced is whoever is willing to pay for it. The choice to buy involves opportunity cost, and individuals weigh the value of alternative uses of their scarce resource, their money, in deciding what to buy. And amazingly, with no one in charge, decentralized market economies answer the three economic questions very routinely and they've compiled an amazing record of wealth production and high standards of living. They're able to do this because of the coordinating function of market prices. Market prices, which by the way are not the same thing as price tags, market prices are generated by the interactions of buyers and sellers. Buyers send signals to sellers about whether they value products as much as, more than, or less than the price on the tag by how readily they purchase the products. Sellers respond to that information, considering the cost of the resources they used in production and deciding whether to change the price on the tag to meet the market price, whether to pay for more resources to produce more, or whether to use their resources to produce something else. Now, just as buyers and sellers of products buyers and sellers of resources respond to prices too. We're all resource owners, owners of our own labor, if nothing else. And we all decide what price we're willing to accept in return for selling our labor. So there are price tags in labor markets too. They're called wages. If the price tag is too low, we don't fill out the job application. And if enough of us don't fill out the application, the price tag will change or the producer will decide to produce something else, which means that then he uses his entrepreneurial resource in a different way too. All of which is to say that one of the most important benefits of a decentralized economy that uses markets to allocate resources is that resources, goods, and services are automatically directed to their highest valued uses. And remember, that this happens without anybody being in charge. In a centralized economy, also known as a command or planned economy, the three economic questions are answered by the government. Now we saw in lesson one that the Soviet leadership decided what should be produced. Remember that they chose industrial capital and military goods over consumer goods. So, okay, we can see that part pretty easily. But what might not be so obvious to us is that the government also answered the how and for whom questions. The how question in the USSR was answered by GOSPLAN, the Communist Central Planning Agency, and it responded to the answers to the what question that were given them by the leaders in the Politburo. GOSPLAN allocated resources first to the government prioritized projects and then allocated the rest by trying to determine what consumers wanted and needed. Then they created models that attempted to balance the available resources with the various requirements and priorities of different categories of production, 
Over time, as the Soviet economy grew in size and complexity, so did this administrative task. By the 1980s, there were 50 industrial ministries that were responsible for coordinating the production of 24 million different products. And this in an economy in which resources and production facilities were scattered across nine time zones. The growth rates of the early 50s suggest that initially this centralized economic decision making worked pretty well. There's some common sense logic to that, particularly in terms of the task of industrializing an impoverished, backward, but resource-rich economy by adding capital equipment. A case can also be made with reference to the early history of the Soviet Union that centralized allocation of resources could be relatively efficient. For instance, if Goss plan called for building a hydroelectric plant, the ministers could simply identify a segment of the workforce and have them moved to work on the project. If the government wanted someone to work on a dam, he or she went where they were told to and worked on the dam. Another boost to productivity came from the influx of Western technology. The United States was willing to share both directly and indirectly through the shipment of machinery and supplies as part of the Lend-Lease program, and to some extent after World War II and before the West realized the full extent of Soviet intransigence in the Cold War. In the post-war 50s, these productivity gains began to show themselves. Okay, now, compare the command process to how moving resources would play out in a market economy. For example, how did Henry Ford get labor resources reallocated to Detroit as the demand for and production of automobiles was growing in the United States? He certainly couldn't call up a minister of production and ask for more workers to be sent. Market allocation of labor resources was a more involved process than someone simply ordering workers to go to Detroit. First, Ford had to offer higher wages to lure the workers away from other jobs. They had to hear about the higher wages, and then they had to decide whether or not to bear the opportunity cost to themselves and their families of changing jobs and relocating. Now that's a little more complex than a government official simply commandeering and moving the workers, but it'll prove in the long run to be better at allocating labor resources to their most highly valued uses. But back to the Soviet Union. In the simple economy of the post-war years, the five-year plans did seem to have the ability to direct investment and to efficiently allocate workers and other resources to the targeted production. And central direction did lead to rapid industrial growth and the accompanying military strength. The changeover to large-scale production resulted in significant increases in output from economies of scale. And because of the narrow priorities of the leaders, the process of allocating resources was relatively simple. Not much went into the consumer sector, and people were so poor that any additions to basic goods and services of food, clothing, and sh shelter were improvements. So, it looks in the early 50s like the Soviet economy was on the track of progress. But then something went wrong. Why didn't the high growth rates continue under Khrushchev? The simplest answer to that question is that the Soviet economy didn't have the information provided by prices. And as the economy became more complex, the planners couldn't gather and process enough information to allocate resources to their most valued uses. You can actually see the difficulty of this task in the activity demonstration video called Missing Markets and Mixing Prices, which you'll watch as part of the Lesson 2 assignments. But we can also illustrate the problem of economies without market prices by considering the functions market prices perform in unplanned, decentralized economies for both consumers and producers. When a consumer enters a store in our market economy, what piece of information is most important in his decision to buy or not buy the product in question? Answer, the price. Okay, now certainly color, quality, brand, style, all those things matter. But in the end, the decision is, given all those other factors, am I willing to pay the price? 
And when producers consider production of a good or service, what's the most important piece of information for them? Be careful. Because again, it's the price. Now, I hear you out there saying, what about profit? Well, what about profit? How does a producer figure out if he's going to make any profit? Right. He has to know the price, which, remember, he doesn't get to set. Yes, he can stick on any price tag he wants, but he can't make people pay it. When he's trying to figure out whether he can make a profit, the essential piece of information is what's the market price, which he can then compare to his production cost. Interesting, isn't it? That for both consumers and producers, the question is ultimately, what's the price? Market prices are messages going back and forth between buyers and sellers that coordinate markets and they eliminate any role for a central planner. Prices send a message to consumers about how costly it is to use resources to produce this good or service over other goods or services. And prices send messages to producers about the relative values that consumers place on various goods and services. As people react to the prices, both in consumption and production, the messages fly back and forth and prices adjust. In the process, resources are spontaneously directed to where they're most valuable. It works like this. Suppose a particular type of drinking glass and a pair of reading glasses are made from the same resources. The drinking glass sells for $2 each and the reading glasses sell for $5 a pair. What are the prices telling us about the relative value of using resources to produce drinking glasses or reading glasses? Right. We value using the resources to produce reading glasses more than twice as much as using them for drinking glasses. Okay, here's another example. Price, in this case in the form of wages, also provides information about the most valuable uses of labor. Suppose with the same time, talent, education, skills, effort, enjoyment, whatever, you could produce wedding photos or food advertisements. Pay $15,000 a year as a wedding photographer, $35,000 a year clicking snapshots of hamburgers. Again, the price tells us the most highly valued use of your labor. Okay, so that's how things work in a decentralized economy that allocates through markets. Now think of the Soviet Union and the number of allocation decisions, a number that literally grew into the tens of millions by 1980, that had to be made by the production ministers. How did they know things like what size boots to produce, what price tag to put on the boots, and how many workers to assign to the boot factories? Actually, how did they know whether anyone even wanted boots? Well, the short answer is that they observed, they collected data, and then they guessed. There were price tags, but no price signals in the Soviet economy because there were no markets. Prices were administered. They were set by bureaucrats using models that tried to balance the available resources and the output targets determined by the Politburo and Goss plan. And the term administered prices is basically a euphemism for guess as far as contributing to the struggle against scarcity. In the Soviet Union, the guesses weren't too hard when people were severely impoverished and on the verge of starvation. But as the economy grew and became more complex, the shortcomings of administered prices became obvious, at least to the citizens, who actually began to joke about the quirks and failings of the system. One joke said that in the grand plan for world communism, the Soviets would leave New Zealand as an island market in the Pacific. Why, you ask? Well, so that the planners would have something to use as a guide for the prices of resources and products in the rest of the world. The task of gathering information grew astronomically as the economy grew. The absence of prices not only deprived the ministers of information on which to base their answers to the how question, it also meant that there was no feedback mechanism 
that they could use to gauge whether their resource allocations were right in the sense of creating the goods and services people wanted and valued. With no way to measure consumers' demand for or satisfaction with particular goods and services, misallocation was predictable. Virtually everything was in short supply. Remember, there was still huge diversion of resources away from consumer goods. So, although there were stories of products that ended up in warehouses because nobody wanted them, in reality, almost everything that was produced was purchased sooner or later. If consumers couldn't get what they wanted, they bought whatever was available. So that didn't provide any information about what was more or less valuable. Because prices were administered and the stores were run by the state, prices didn't change in response to demand and supply. If something was highly valued, the way you could tell was that the line was long not because people were willing to pay a higher price. People paid the price in time, not just in money. And while the length of the line certainly provided some valuable information about consumer demands, it wasn't very dependable when everything was in short supply. You didn't know if people were in line because they valued the product or because that was all that was available. And even if the line length information was accurate, it didn't get passed on in a feedback loop. There was no connection between the store and the factory to say, hey, uh, we got long lines here, send us some more. And even if there had been, the factory manager could not have, and probably would not have been motivated to, change the production target that he'd been given by the ministry. Finally, the minister's allocation task was also complicated by their very power within the system. Negotiation, favor-seeking and granting, and bribery figured heavily in the effort to acquire resources. Concealing or misrepresenting information about needs and production capabilities was common, as the ministers jockeyed for control over resources and for power within the party structure. On the production end, factory managers were given production targets and allocations of resources with which to meet those targets. The lack of good information and constant misallocation encouraged them to hoard resources against an uncertain future. So the minister didn't really know if the resources were used as he directed or if in fact they were used at all. The production targets were usually in aggregate amounts, which created incentives for factory managers to meet the target rather than meet the consumer's needs. If the targets were set in weight or tonnage, the factory tended to emphasize size rather than number. Examples include lamps with heavy lead bases, railroad spike-sized nails, glass panes that were too thick to see through. On the other hand, output targets set as numbers of units resulted in tiny fragile lamps, tacks rather than nails, and flimsy glass panes that broke in strong winds. Missing markets and missing prices created problems in all sectors of the economy, not just in the production of goods and services. There was, for example, no financial sector, no commercial banks, no mortgage companies, no stock exchange. Interest rates, the price of borrowing money, were non-existent. In a government-based planned economy, individuals don't make business investments. The allocation of financial resources was the responsibility of the ministries. One consequence was that investment was allocated with an eye to enhancing the power of the ministry or the minister within the system. A very visible result was the trend toward larger and larger projects, size becoming a measure of the effectiveness and power of the minister. Examples include factories over a mile long, and apartment buildings that house tens of thousands of people. The bigger the project, the better it reflected the influence of the minister within the system. There were also no markets in real estate. A minister would make decisions about land use with no way to compare its value for alternative uses. Factories, farms, and literally entire towns were plopped down on the map where a minister decided they should be and with little regard to things like transportation costs, partly because the information was not readily available. Remember that prices were administered there as well. 
The result was that the dynamism of changing land use that we see in market economies was absent in the Soviet Union. To summarize then, the impressive growth of the Soviet economy in the years after World War II was largely the result of being able to capture the productivity gains of forcing investment in industrialization on an extremely poor and disorganized agricultural society that had suffered continual disruption for almost half a century. But the gains were fleeting in the sense that industrial growth quickly increased the complexity of the allocative task and the volume of information rose beyond the capabilities of a centralized system. Without the signaling and feedback functions performed by market prices, the production ministries just couldn't sustain the pace of growth they'd engineered in a simpler economy. The greatest difference between centralized and decentralized economic decision-making processes then is in their ability to transmit information about the relative scarcity of resources. That critical information is only found in the prices that emerge from markets. The opportunity cost to the Soviet Union of choosing centralized control was sacrificing a price-based allocation of resources and output. Clearly, the Soviet leaders thought that the gains in terms of their goals of rapid industrialization military strength, and the spread of communism were worth that cost, but the cost they accepted imposed huge burdens on their citizens. Even as the Khrushchev era came to a close, and even as the cracks in the economic leg were beginning to be felt again, this was still a time of great buy-in by Soviet citizens. Their lives were better than before, even if only marginally. They saw progress around them. There was the legacy of the victory in World War II and the growing respect for the Soviet Union in the world. And there was the triumph of Sputnik. All contributed to the strength of the Soviet Union's institutional foundation. In Lesson 3, we'll follow Soviet history into the detente period of the 70s under Khrushchev's protege and successor Leonid Brezhnev and look more closely at another level in the Soviet hierarchy, uncovering the incentives faced by Soviet factory managers and the behavior that resulted from those incentives.